皮草不是时尚，皮草本来不应该成为时尚，但是如今，仍有成千上万的动物，在牢笼中耗尽生命。时至今天，这些动物的一生，仍遭受无尽的折磨。为了改变这一切，我们还有很长的路要走。在所有的皮草生产中，不外乎极其残忍的对待动物，使用有害的化学物质，带来一场场的环境灾难。亚洲是全球皮草消费最多的地区，但是这样的风潮是可以改变的吗？越来越多的时尚品牌已经承诺了不再使用皮草，越来越多的国家。已经明文禁止皮草动物的养殖，越来越多的人意识到了这种残酷的真相。改变人们观念是艰难的，教育才是最好的方式。行动亚洲作为中国生命关怀教育的先行者，致力于培养儿童的悲悯心和同情心。希望就在眼前，你我共同创造。We knew it was coming. The signs were all there. We knew we had to change, but we didn't. Destroying wild habitats, exploiting wildlife, turning a blind eye—maybe it would go away. It didn't. It began to bite back. Primates and HIV, civets and SARS, bats and Ebola. Covid-19 is not the first pandemic, and it won't be the last, unless we deal with the root causes. It's time to stop the wildlife trade and to support compassionate, sustainable farming to protect our planet. Let's change our relationship with nature forever, for all life. I really haven't bought pea seeds. Wearing pea seeds makes you look pretty, but it may make your body feel pretty. Pea seeds have toxins in them that may harm your body's health. And there are no one who wants to live in a cold temperature room in a high humidity room. If pea seeds are still growing, that day the Earth may be in trouble. Pea seeds are still growing, that day the Earth may be in trouble. Pea seeds are still growing, that day the Earth may be in trouble. Pea seeds are still growing, that day the Earth may be in trouble. Pea seeds are still growing, that day the Earth may be in trouble. Pea seeds are still growing, that day the Earth may be in trouble. Pea seeds are still growing, that day the Earth may be in trouble. Pea seeds are still growing, that day the Earth may be in trouble. Pea seeds are still growing, that day the Earth may be in trouble. 穿的带有毛边的外套和帽顶上的小毛球等等，这些都是廉价的真皮草哟。但此刻又有皮草消费者跳出来说，皮草商家说真皮草是纯天然低碳环保的呀，是完全可被生物降解的呀。胡香坊皮草有塑料材质，但研究测试发现，动物皮草的生物降解性最高仅达到百分之二十五点八。现在还觉得自己没买过皮草吗？还觉得皮草美吗？你是不是皮草消费者？可能已经不是目前唯一的讨论。最急迫的是，如何携手改善皮草产业一直以来对地球上的人、动物、环境所带来的全方位危害？说到这儿，有人想不通了：说皮草养殖危害动物，我秒懂；但皮草养殖怎么还破坏土地、破坏森林，导致全球气候变暖了？例如，皮草养殖场中动物排泄所释放出的大量氨气，也就是俗称的阿莫尼亚，氨气与自然中的其他化合物结合，导致土壤酸化时土壤失去吸收二氧化碳的功能，同时也会摧毁森林，导致储存在每棵树中的二氧化碳被释放。出来，大量的二氧化碳等温室气体就这样被排放到我们生活的环境中。温室气体就是让地球表面温度日渐上升的主要原因。因此，零皮草才能有效协助降低碳排。正如联合国科普二十七提出的目标，地球上的每个人都有责任和义务为全球变暖生活限制在二度以下的目标做出努力。别以为这个目标和你关系不大，人人都想在地球上长久可持续的过着美滋滋、乐呵呵的生活吧？那这就需要你我齐心协力，一同努力实现这个目标。Hello, everyone. 
distinguished the guests. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to our audiences across the globe. Thank you for joining us for the Compassion and Fashion Forum for free for the grain development of the industry. Which is also the ninth International Sustainable for Free Fashion Festival 2023 Shenzhen Fashion Week. I am your host today, Liu Xiaoya. In the past, we've always been given different definitions in answering the question, what is fashion? Now, when facing with the new generation of the Generation Z consumers, and as we have been taking challenges, from the COVID and other pandemics. Now that people have voiced out that sustainability is the new fashion, and on behalf of that, well, sustainability for the Chinese fashion industry obviously is an embodiment of both opportunities and the challenges. So in order to conclude more experiences and explore a way into the future, today we have been holding this forum of 2023 Shenzhen Fashion Week, a part of that agenda, the ninth International Sustainable for Free Fashion, uh, Fashion Festival and 2023 Compassion in Fashion Forum. We've invited experts from multiple uh, industries and institutions to focus uh, on the development of fashion, as well as we have invited the trendsetters and the trend analysts of the industry to tell us about their latest uh, understanding and explorations into a more sustainable way of living a uh, fashion lifestyle. People say that green is the new black. Our ongoing collaboration with CBC, GDF, and SGIA can attest to that. This B2B forum is also the 13th RCEP meeting and under Act Asia's umbrella. And now that this program has received the UN's recognition as a part of the Conscious Fashion and the Lifestyle Network. This network is also working to accelerate the progress towards the SDGs. In 2022, despite the continuing challenges due to COVID, Act Asia reached great numbers of children, consumers, and professionals through its programs. As a result of Act Asia's work, we have been presented with the Best Charitable Collective Award at the China Charity Festival. We seek to highlight that Fur Free is the first step towards sustainability, a journey that the industry as a whole must change to avoid consequences to our planet and the living conditions for everyone around the globe. We are pleased to offer the first online course on Xiao which explains the impact of fur in fashion on animals, people, and environment, making it a major milestone in fur free education. This is our first class in this course. So if you would like to make your first step today, please sign up for the course. Act Asia recruited a record number of new fur free retailers in 2022. That helped us to connect the fur free companies to consumers seeking ethical goods. In total, 25 new brands were added to the existing network, bringing a new total to 81 by the end of the year in China and more than 1,500 globally. The IPCC report have uh, pointed out that there are abundant opportunities for accelerated decarbonization across a garment life cycle, such as decarbonizing material production through regenerative agriculture, minimizing waste, decarbonizing garment manufacturing in the upstream operations or use sustainable materials, improve the packaging, decarbonize the retail systems, regenerative end-of-life ecosystem, and reduce overproduction from brands. And the UN's Fashion Industry Charter for Climate Action Progress Report 2023 has highlighted that the need for more collaborative efforts and stated that although there had been progresses, the implementation needs to be accelerated in order to achieve those green possibilities. We hope our forum today can create connections between all elements within the fashion industry's ecosystem and use for free as a first step to compassionate, sustainable, and more ethical raw materials being used. The step is well supported by the industry's research 
and the new materials are being developed as a result of it. For example, Milo, Koba, and other next-gen materials are the trailblazers of a new, more sustainable reality in fashion. So that uh, let's abandon archaic, harmful, and resource-intensive ways. Let's be brave, successful, and compassionate in our choices for everyone's sake. Let's all join hands. Those choices will bring newer, greener, and more sustainable development for us. Now let's give the floor to a co-host of our forum today. Ms. Pan Ming, President of SGIA, Shenzhen Garment Industry Association, to address us. Ms. Pan, please. Hello, Xiaoya. Hello, Echo. Hi, Ms. Pan. Well, dear guests, dear experts, scholars, Good afternoon. I am uh, president of uh, SGIA, Pan Ming. It is my great pleasure to join you through this virtual meeting at 2023 Shenzhen Fashion Weekend, the ninth International Sustainable for Free Fashion Festival. On behalf of the uh, Shenzhen Garment Industry Association, we'd like to congratulate on the uh, successful opening of today's forum and thank you all for joining. China as a big country in participating in responding to the climate change globally, also as a leader, have post put forward the dual carbon policy, which led the direction for decarbonization. And as one of the first piloted the decarbonization city, as well as the carbon trade mechanisms operation, we have recently launched the, the green carbon uh, low carbon uh, policies to encourage the new development of the industries in order to accelerate the technology adoption for those newer and greener technologies we have been trying to build new parks to push for faster achievement of uh, carbon peaking and uh, carbon neutrality hoping to bring greener lifestyles way of living and production ways. As one of the cities with the most advanced uh, garment industry, we have been focusing on upgrading the industry but also maintaining sustainability as a core competency of our development. We echoed proactively to the dual carbon policy. April last year established a sustainability working group. That working committee have conglomerated the research institutions, experts in the uh, garment industry, as well as uh, in uh, environmental protection. And we have discussed about the standardization of decarbonization assessment and greener garment development. Now, many companies have joined the initiative to disclose their carbon footprint to publish uh, as well. They are the leading ones. We've also uh, is initiated the globally first carbon neutrality fashion week, establishing a leading image of Shenzhen to show people's confidence in Shenzhen. The carbon neutrality fashion week of Shenzhen also had caught the attention of journalists and many uh, sustainable designers. The Pazans Fashion Institute in the United States would like to establish uh, postgraduate programs, and the Hong Kong Fashion University also would like to collaborate with us. Now, with the carbon footprint and uh, carbon labeling programs, we'd like to uh, push for greener, more sustainable development of the industry. Uh, simultaneously, we've been calling on the government to, to further support the industry associations and the companies so that we can all participate in this course of establishing a mechanism of carbon label, standardization, and other basic fundamental data to be provided. We've been leading the companies to do the works related to uh, green uh, carbon labels and the lead and guide the consumers to properly choose greener products and promote greener consumptions. We will join hands with other participants in the industries to build a more dynamic industry. We hope 
to focus on dynamic fashion, so digital fashion, sustainability, carbon neutrality, new, consum new consumptions, create new values, and establish a new future for the uh, fashion industry. Last but not least, I wish today's forum a great success. Thank you, Ms. Pan, very much. Now let's give the floor to another co-host of our forum today, which is uh, CBC GDF Deputy Director Ms. Xiongyu Tong from China Biodiversity Conservation and Green Development Foundation. She is also a member of uh, IUCN. Now let's give the floor to Ms. Xiongyu Tong. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, good afternoon. I am Xiong Yu Tong, Deputy Secretary General of China Biodiversity Conservation and Green Development Foundation. I am very pleased to participate in the 2023 Compassion in Fashion Forum and the 13th RCEP4C meeting to discuss for free for the green development of the industry. We, CBC GDF, is a national association for biodiversity conservation and green development. We were funded in 1985 to welcome the return of China's endemic species of elk. Over the past 30 years, we have been dedicated to promoting ecological civilization, green development, and a sustainable development, and protecting biodiversity and ecological environment. We had made uh, a series of significant achievements and played an important role in innovation, research, and the popularization of science. On November the 15th, 2020, shortly after the formal signing of the uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partner Agreement, RCEP, CBC GDF established our RCEP work group. We recognized that in between government and society, if on a unified, free, and open cooperation platform, we could focus on environmental protection, biodiversity, conservation, and a wide range of areas, including sustainable fashion to have exchanges and cooperations, that would be of great significance and it would have far-reaching impacts on the economy, environmental protection, and the development of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. RCEP4C stands for Civil Society, Culture, Communication, and Cooperation. Today, CBC GDF has successfully held 13 RCEP4C meetings, and I have participated in them since the first one. The meetings discussed on the opportunities and the challenges following the signing of RCEP about water security, biodiversity crisis, youth action for free and other perspectives aiming to explore how to better respond to the global crisis and promote global sustainable development. Development of fashion industry, including the fur industry, consumes a large amount of natural resources and has a huge impact not only on the climate but also on biodiversity. Life cycle of the fur industry from raw materials to finish the garments consumes natural resources, generates carbon emissions, produces polluted wastewater, causes serious negative environmental impacts. The pollution is just behind the biggest polluter industry in the world, petrochemical, and estimated that by 2030, garment industry will even overtake that. Green and sustainable development and the decarbonization have gradually become a global consensus. Consumer awareness continues to deepen. People gradually turn to use of garments with higher quality made of more environmental friendly fabrics. Also, the potential health risks of the uh, fur industry cannot be ignored. Promotion of fur free and the discontinuation of animal fur farming are more conducive to safeguarding our public health and slowing down the zoonotic diseases prevalence. Climate change, loss of biodiversity and public health are among the multiple global crises that threaten our existence. And living in harmony with nature, how to do that, that's an important issue. Sustainable production and consumption is an important step in the harmonious coexistence between human beings and the nature. Driving the communities of human destiny, life on Earth, and human health and wellness is our common responsibility. We are willing to continue work together with all parties. 
in the field of uh, environmental protection and sustainable development. We are willing to invite stakeholders, enterprises, public welfare organizations, and scientific experts to share their experiences and brainstorm ideas on aspects such as promotion of green supply chains, practice of green meetings, the promotion of green business initiatives, the promotion of consumer green rights, sustainable investments, and financing, so that uh, we can all discuss about and promote win-win cooperation. Thank you again for your participation today. Wish you a great success for today's meeting. Well, we thank Ms. Xiong for her speech. Now we are going to hear the keynote speech. First of all, we will have Dr. Xu Lijie to share about the relationship between fashion industry and climate change and how we can use standard to better promote the green development of the fashion industry. Professor Xu Lijie is the director of Institute of Green Development and Environment of Shenzhen Institute of Standards and Technology. She has a lot of experience in energy saving as well as using standards to promote sustainability. She has held more than 10 projects, including topics like carbon emission, rice trading, and many other issues. She has been the major author of China's first manual of training personnel in reducing carbon emissions and other things. And she has offered the consultancy for more than a hundred companies in Shenzhen to make their operations more sustainable. Now we give the floor to Professor Xu Lijie to start her keynote speech. Dear friends online, greetings for all of you. I'm very honored to attend 2023 International Fashion Zero Fur Industry Meeting and talk about how can we realize green and sustainable development. Today, I will talk about fashion and climate change, fashion industry's commitment and actions, fashion industry's carbon footprint evaluations, carbon labels, as well as how can we use standard to make the fashion industry greener and more sustainable. With the improvement of people's living standards, more of more people are willing to use garments and other fashionable elements to display their personal taste and style. Young people prefer fast fashion because it is of lower price and more products, and this can meet the young consumers' demands. According to statistics, 20 years ago, Zara launched hundreds of new products every week, while today they can launch more than 20,000 products each year. We also have another statistics from Nature that is the global textile production per capita actually increased from 5.9 kilograms to 13 kilograms between 1975 and 2018. More than 100 billion pieces of clothing are discarded globally each year. In China alone, more than 26 million tons of used clothing are thrown away each year. And those discarded garments always go into landfill plants or waste incinerators. This is a huge waste. While the fashion industry has a very complicated system of operation, we have a lot of procedures such as producing raw materials, producing products, packaging, transportation. Every one of those procedures can have a lot of emissions. According to UNEP, from the production of cotton to putting the product in the store, Producing a pair of jeans will emit 33.4 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent. Among those emissions, 33% from the production of fibers and fabric, 8%
come from cutting, sewing the jeans. Another 16% comes from packaging, transportation, and retailing. And the last 40% comes from consumer use, including washing the jeans and discarding it. A Sweden scientist discovered that an average cotton shirt may release more than 2,000 carbon dioxide equivalents, while a polyester dress can release nearly 17 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalents. And most of our clothes are made of fossil fuel combustion. According to data, the global fashion industry generated about 2.1 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions in 2018. And this is the total of the emissions by France, Germany, and the UK added. If in 2013 we will have 8.5 billion global population, then our consumption of the fashion field will boom and we will have more energy waste, labor investment, and environmental pollution coming out of this development. The international community attach more importance to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, especially for the fashion field. And now we are using carbon label as a tool. This will be a future trend. Now let's talk about what are the brands to take the first actions? Well, we have the Caring Group. They have mandated the carbon label for their products, which can tell the consumer the carbon emissions coming from the production of a certain clothes. Well, by 2030, they want to reduce the carbon emissions by 50% for scope 1 and scope 2. And they want to reduce the emissions by 40% in scope 3. Apart from that, HRM and levies have also made correspondent commitments. And they have set a goal for scope 1 and scope 2 together, and another goal for scope 3 alone. Well, meanwhile, we see that many products like many brands like Adidas, they also announced that they will Then Okay, seems like we have something wrong with playing the video, so we need a second to restart. Thank you for patience.
果暂时不能这个处理到的话。我们是不是可以先请 It seems like we have something wrong with the section. So, can we invite the next speaker to start her speech? We've seen Luffy online. So, could you please turn on your camera? Are you there, Miss Yao? Luffy Yao. Yes, yes, I am online. Okay. Good afternoon, Miss Yao. Is it convenient for you to chip in right now? As we had a technical error there. Okay, I'll just start sharing my screen. All right, please, Miss Lupi, and let me take this time to introduce everyone. Uh, introduce to everyone about you, Miss Lupi Yao Yao Qingzhao. She has over 15 years of experience in design and manager work in fashion industry. She is now leading the Chinese content team as the trend director of WGSN China. She has been directing the team studying local trends in retail and the fashion industry for a long time, providing professional trend guidance for different industries. She provided consulting services for a variety of companies, including Disney, Covestro, Adidas, Alibaba, Hair, Huawei, Li Ning, and so on. Before joining WGSN, she had been invited to exhibit her design works at the Royal Royal V&A Museum and a British Pioneer Saddlers Well Theatre. And had been interviewed by many mainstream media organizations. Today, Miss Lu Pi Yao will tell us about、uh, the system of values for the Z generation and also their priorities on eco、uh, protections. Miss Lu Pi Yao, please. Okay, please allow me to share my screen. No problem. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Well, there might be a little bit of delay in switching the slides. Just let me know if you see that. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Yao Qingzhao, Lu Pi Yao. Today, I would like to tell tell you about the sense of values and environmental protection priorities for the Z generation. When we study the consumers, we would look at their system of values or their sense of values because that would、uh, affect the, their all sorts of choices, their lifestyles, their preference for fashion, the way, the attitudes, the actions they have over a lot of things. And for the Z generation consumers, we took a really long time to study them because they have a big population. Globally, it had already reached 1.8 billion. And many retailers are paying attention to this focal group, Z generation. They inhibited the environmental protection awareness and the social responsibility from the previous generation. So their sense of values is what we care about. It's also a part of their lives. So in terms of their sense of values, I have six aspects to talk about today. The first thing we've noticed is that is they have less loyalty for brands. Many brands. Owners, they wish their consumers have very strong loyalty for them, so that、uh, it would be easier for the brands to do business operation. But, well, unfortunately, the Z generation has less loyalty for certain brands. They wouldn't care if you're a very famous brand, and they definitely wouldn't buy. Would buy from you. That's not true. In many cases, they care more about whether the system value of a brand matches up、uh, with their own. So if the company cannot show them that they are actually in match with each other in terms of the sense of values, they are more likely to sway or even leave the brands to choose other,、uh, choose from other competitors which fit into their system of values more. So for the enterprises and the brands, a very key factor they would have to consider is that how to、uh, understand the Z generation sense of values. That's Supposed to be the first step, and then build their 
uh, the company's sense of values and uh, in order to come closer to those Z generation, in order to have that echoing sentiment in between the brand and the Z generation consumers to have a longer term, more sustainable trust from those Z generations. Second sense we found is that uh, these people very much care about environmental protection and the sustainability. Unlike the previous generation, they don't think this is something far out of reach, just a conceptual thing. They believe it's some things about very detailed life choices. They could do it more than just being politically correct. They would go to parks to pick up garbage or participate in those activities or even organize public welfare activities and events to really participate and devote into these courses. And this is how made uh, what made this generation different from previous generations. They've been doing this, also hoping to feel happy and also show their own value as a human being and show their care for the society. The third characteristic about the Z generation is that uh, they are always trying to find the small blessings within life in the details. Now people have faster pace and rhythm in life, but these Z generation consumers, they pay attention to their own feelings. They're not like the previous generation, always on a uh, hustle, trying to earn money to feed the family place, uh, bread on the tables, but they would care more about their own feelings in daily lives, would like to slow down from time to time, especially now that after COVID, uh, yet the uh, pandemic controls, restrictions have been lifted, but the terror, the uh, fear, the anxiety and exhaustion, that kind of emotions and sentiments still linger. That's why they care for themselves from the bottom of their heart about their own happiness and their well-being. These are their sentimental directions they would like to go toward. So from the details of their daily lives, the Z generation would like to slow down, look for the smaller blessings and achieve uh, those happiness moments. For example, they sit down together to boil tea and enjoy it. You can see that you don't have many luxury things in that picture, just some nuts and fruits and a pot of tea. Uh, very simple things, but once, once you get to sit down together with your friends, that you can talk and sit down together to enjoy that moment. That's what they call the small blessings, even just for a temporary short term. For the post the 70s, post the 80s, you wouldn't find that very attractive. But for the younger generation, this is what they are in pursuit of. They enjoy that happiness and it's quite important for them. Next is that uh, they uh, have uh, been holding on to the principle that personality matters the most and have a very strong sense of nation pride because they grew up in a time, especially for the Chinese Z generation, which is more prevalent. They have a stronger sense of national pride because they grew up when China had been a strong country and when they buy Chinese products, they truly, genuinely love those and are proud of those products. And they want more personality. Well, this applies to all Z generation across the globe. They were willing to pay that premium for products that they need or they are interested in. And if they could enjoy further customization services, they would also fund those uh, in favor because it fits into their pursuit for personality. Well, on the right side, this picture, you may think it's a little bit uh, a cliche, but that's actually from uh, a Malaysian new designer generation of product. They basically have been making spring festival related capsules. And some of those elements are inspired by traditional Chinese characteristics. You may see that this is a very funny and cliche picture. Uh, those things are probably going to be used by the older generation, the parents. However, it has now become a subculture that youngsters would find it uh, funny and they even put it into uh, services and uh, products because it simply matches with their principle of personality matters the most. They look for fun in those activities. The fifth 
uh, topic I'd like to touch upon is that they have been shrewd in budgeting. Just now, I said they would like to pay a premium for products they are uh, interested in or they really like. And here I say they are shrewd in budgeting. So are they actually contradictory to each other, these two notions? Well, the fact is that uh, they are not contradictory because they had grown up in an era of the Internet and they are not stupid when buying things, even if they are willing to pay that premium for things that they really like and need. Before they buy anything, they would go to offline stores to experience, to compare the price from multiple online channels, read the details, or even analyze the parameters of the products, fully understand the product before making a final purchase decision. So uh, from this perspective, you can say that the Z generation are willing to pay for the premium, but also have been very shrewd in budgeting. They are much difficult to fool especially at the post-pandemic global political and economic situation, the Z generation and other consumers have all been even more shrewd, more thrifting than before, uh, which is also another global trend as we have observed. We have also been seeing that online they would also would like to show how they save up how they uh, do the savings and how they plan for those uh, financing and the wealth management. Sometimes even have a daily record of that. And you can see that uh, they would also publish vlogs on how to buy cheaper things, to do more things, as well as to save up. So from all these detailed aspects, you can see that the Z generation has been a very shrewd budgeting group of consumers. The sixth topic I want to touch upon is that they are more willing to escape from reality from time to time than other generations. Other generations would also do that, but the Z generation do it more than others. That's why they would like to uh, indulge in games and even gain more spiritual and uh, emotional uh, satisfactions from virtual world. So those six aspects were the sense of values for the Z generation. And now in my part two, I'd like to talk about their environmental protection priorities. Just now, as I said, they are a generation which really focus, really value environmental protection and the sustainability. They do no longer believe it's a concept far out of reach, nor just the politically correct things. It's very detailed urgent life choices they'd have to make and to take actions upon, uh, which is also why many enterprises have moved uh, environmental protection further up on their agenda. And uh, on the first point I'd like to touch upon here is to go against the greenwashing. But what is greenwashing? What is the definition of that? Greenwashing means when an organization has been boasting about their actions related to environmental protection, environmental protection awareness, or uh, edges in those regards, because they believe that consumers care for this. So they just uh, talk about it instead of actually been doing such things. So that's an action of greenwashing, as we uh, name for those actions for the green, uh, for, for those organizations. Sometimes they wouldn't believe that it's going to cause uh, negative impacts. They believe that uh, the consumers wouldn't be able to discover uh, the reality, nor that they are actually uh, knowing that much details about the things they've been boasting about. However, that is no longer true when it comes to the Z generation. So if they didn't do something and they claim that they had done it, they would lose the trust from consumers. And that's how greenwashing would do negatively for the enterprises and companies shouldn't do that. So no greenwashing anymore, do real things to benefit the environment. And how should we ever actually do that? So here we have a few suggestions. More consumers now have uh, that preference for environmental protection and the attitudes got more prevalent as well. However, the companies are taking more serious actions of greenwashing. So the first thing they need to do is to stop it and then do real environmental protection related activities and works and then take uh, the leverage those action advertisements to do the publicity 
uh, promotion for them and also uh, keep on to their promises and fulfillment of their uh, environmental uh, commitments in order to avoid losing the trust from consumers and try to regain the trust from them and maintain total transparency instead of disappointing them again and again and fully lost their trust. Publicity's purpose is to promote the sales, but it has to fit with the reality, the facts. Consumers care about that. So that's a way to regain their trust. The second point is about environmental protection related innovations. If we really rely on publicity, that's just uh, something on a paper and we need a real actions. We've been paying attention to some of the latest innovations globally, and here we have something worth sharing, which is turn wasted air into fabrics. In this regard, we can see that when compared with, with 2010, the whole world would have to cut almost half by carbon dioxide emission by 2030 in order to avoid the direst consequences of climate change. Carbon dioxide's concentration in our air has already reached its historical high. The product we get in contact with every day also bears carbon dioxide within them. But on the other hand, though, emission of carbon dioxide is uh, having some quite negative influences. But on the contrary, it could also be used in some positive ways. It could help to increase the strength and the durability of plastics and uh, concrete. It could also help the textile industry to wean from unprocessed oil-based fiber. The fashion industry, as we previously have just learned, is also an uh, environmental non-friendly industry. And by taking these measures and the new technologies, we could also turn this industry greener. Here's another technology I'd like to talk about, carbon capturing technology. According to the IPCC, uh, if we want to reach or maintain a global temperature rise within two degrees according to the Paris uh, Climate Agreement, carbon capturing technology will play a vital role. According to estimation of the UN, the fashion industry's carbon emission has accounted for global emissions 8 to 10 percent, while other agencies estimated the number to be in between 2 to 8 percent. But no matter which is correct, we'd have to pay attention to the fashion industry's carbon emission. On the right side, you see a picture. A company which is very much leading in environmental protection technologies, which would like to turn industrial wasted air into materials to benefit many industries. In carbon capturing technology, we can see that with the deepening development of such technologies, some companies have successively developed such technologies to turn uh, the carbon dioxide from our air, capture them, process them, and use bioscience technologies and green chemical processes, turn them into low carbon materials that could be further utilized in other uh, application scenarios. And here we can see a few of those examples. Lululemon is uh, a brand we all know about. So this have worked together with that company I just mentioned, which is named Lens Attack, together with the IGL India Glycose Limited and a Taiwan company FENC to develop ethanol-based polyester and use that in sportswear for a female. And this is how carbon capturing technology can be really put into real products. Another example is the Zara's example. We know that those fast fashion industries have strong pollutions. And now that Zara has been taking some measures to turn towards greener operations, they launched this party dress capsule series, which contains 20% of the fabric to be uh, made from uh, industrial wastes, MEG and PTA. And also on the right side, you see that uh, Swiss footwear brand on running. They indicate that, that they have already built the first sports shoe sole made from carbon dioxide emissions. And obviously the sports brands in fashion industry are more advanced and have stronger awareness for such new technologies and would like to really apply those into their products. 
And apart from those, the third part I'd like to talk about is that sustainable fashion is something we can all contribute to, little by little. Previously, those were to environmental protection. For example, Chou Chu Ting and uh, Shi Yu, they've been using those leftover materials or uh, recycled products and turn them into uh, new dresses and clothes in order to promote their uh, philosophy of sustainable fashion. I have two more detailed examples to share with you. The first one is Chan Chit Lo. We've interviewed its founder, Venice Lo. She told us that uh, it had used uh, more sustainable products, environmental friendly, and she believed that uh, whether a product can be called a luxury depends on how much time we're put into making it instead of uh, determined by whether there have been luxuries or expensive materials used. And she also says something that really uh, touched us. One man's garbage could be the wealth of another man. This series you see on the screen on the left side is named the Mother of the Ocean because when they visited Jeju Island in Korea, uh, there had been females who always dive into the bottom of the ocean to harvest uh, uh, oceanic products and seafoods and they were called those ocean females or ocean women. And this series of uh, clothes were inspired by that occupation, which also have incorporated many uh, environmental protection awareness because it uses those uh, recycled or refabricated materials and fabrics, leftover bits or even leftover silks and steel wires to uh, adhere to their commitment to environmental protection. And this is another example recode uh, under the umbrella of Kolon Group in Korea. And they also have a very strong creativity. We all know about Kolon Group in Korea, but every year they, because of it's a big product, a big group, every year their leftover fabrics is of a very large quantity. And they do not wish to burn those leftover fabrics because it's not eco-friendly, but they have no better way to deal with it. So they set up a new brand, Recode, and their tasks assigned is that they have to use those leftover fabrics, turn them into products that can be commercially turned into revenues. So that's within the DNA of this brand. They would use uh, all kinds of leftover, uh, out-of-season pieces and the discarded fabrics from the warehouse and hire professional designers and craftsmen to work together and use their imagination to make fashion that make more sense. They started though, with their uh, out-of-season and uh, in-stock leftovers, but now they have uh, expanded. They even search and procure other leftover bits and the fabrics, uh, even the uh, safety capsules from uh, uh, automotives industries after the cars were dismantled um, and made them into laptop cases or other bags. And they've been establishing workshops and studios and uh, been given lectures to promote that awareness of environmental protection and has been inviting uh, consumers to join. The leaders or the, the teachers in those studios and the workshops would uh, guide the consumers to do DIYs with those leftover bits and fabrics and uh, they're eligible to take those products away afterwards. And these are all actions that they've been doing, which we can take reference from. So that is all from my perspective. Thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Lupi Yao. You shared with us about the sense of values for the Z generation and their priorities on environmental protection and how they have been uh, 
doing from the perspective of these brands. And I do believe that many of us would like to know more about the Z generation uh, because the future mainstream of consumers and the Z generation is a popular term on the uh, internet. They are also called the uh, ACG people. Normally, they are referred to born in between 1995 to 2009. Just now, while I was listening to her, I found that my sense of values, my sense of consumption is quite similar to the Z generation, even though I am not a Z generation person myself. Anyway, thank you very much, Miss Yao. Now, we'd like to switch back to uh, Professor Xu Lijie to share on how to use standards to do decarbonization and promote the development of the green industry. Well, now the international community is paying more attention to reduce carbon emissions. That is the same for the fashion field. Therefore, we are using carbon label as a tool to promote this whole process. Now, let's take a look at what are the brands among the first to take actions to reduce carbon emissions. First, we have the Caring Group, which is one of the French luxurious group. It has mandated the addition of carbon labels in their textile industry and their clothes. This is very important. They also promised that using 2015 as a base year, by 2025, they will reduce the carbon emissions by 50% for scope one and scope two. And they will also reduce carbon emissions by 40% for scope three. Apart from that, HRM and Levis have also made commitments, but they have selected different time points as their base year, and they have set a target for scope one and scope two together and another target for scope three alone. So what is scope one and two? That is the carbon emissions coming from the operation of the enterprise itself, while scope three refers to the emissions coming out of the whole supply chain. Meanwhile, a lot of companies are taking actions to reduce emissions. For example, the UK laser manufacturer Marmory has issued made-to-last manifestos through open letter and online campaign. They promise that by 2030, they will make their whole operation recyclable and sustainable. This is for the whole supply chain. And they also promise that by 2035, they will reach net zero emissions. Another one brand is the leisure brand from USA, All Birds. They want to become the first fashion brand in the world to label its entire product line. And they have used the recycled cardboard to use 90% of its packaging. They promise to reduce its carbon footprint by 50% by 2025 and reach carbon neutral by 2030. Another brand is China's domestic brand, brand Peacebird. They've promised to reach a net zero emissions for the whole product production line and they want to reach the net zero emissions for scope one and scope two, which is about their own operation. And also by 2030, they want to make all of their products carbon footprint traceable, which means that they will put carbon label on their products to inform the consumers about the carbon emissions coming from the production of a certain clothes. Another brand is Chinese men's clothing brand Hongdong. By 2040, they want to achieve carbon neutral and they will label all their products with a carbon footprint label. Many other brands have also launched their own specific green product lines. For example, Adidas announced that by 2024, they will use more materials for packaging in collaboration with the brand 
all burned. So from these actions, we can see that many brands, they really focus on raw materials. They want to use the natural materials because that has less emissions. When we talk about a lot of fashion brands and we identify that, they will set specific targets for reducing carbon emissions, specifically for stop one, two, and three. And they also set a time framework. So basically by a certain time point, they will put carbon labels on all of their products or part of their products. So now I'm going to talk about what is carbon footprint and what is carbon label. So carbon footprint can be a tool for us to calculate the carbon emissions coming from the production of a certain product, including the production of raw material and the real production process. So it can be a very meaningful tool. And carbon footprint has been used by more than a thousand enterprises around the world. A lot of renowned multinational companies and retailers have proposed their own plan for reaching carbon neutral. They require their suppliers to calculate the carbon footprint in their operation. And now there are 14 countries and regions that have already proposed certain activities or certifications for carbon footprint. And here are some examples. You can see the carbon label in these pictures. Now you can see the picture on the bottom left. There is a footprint and inside it was the carbon emissions of making that product. In Paris Agreement signed in 2015, 195 countries have committed that they will control the global temperature rise within 1.5 to 2 Celsius degrees. And many countries already took measures to reduce their carbon emissions. For example, UK, USA, Japan, and Australia, they have already proposed a system for carbon labeling. Well, the fashion industry's carbon emissions account for 4% of the global total, which is more than that of aviation and shipping industry. And the retailers, brands, product manufacturers and the factories involved in fashion industry can all emit a lot into the atmosphere and we really care about this issue. And here is some carbon label examples from Japan, UK and Thailand. In April 2021, the French National Assembly have passed an amendment to put carbon emission points on their products. And this amendment is first applied in the textile and clothing industry. And we all know that France is known for its great luxurious industry. So this is a very important signal. Basically, they require the brands and producers to inform the consumers about the carbon emissions of making a certain clothes. They also urge the brands to follow national regulations and guidance. Well, let's take a look at how can a brand to evaluate their carbon footprint and what are the processes? First of all, it's for raw materials. They can either use natural fibers or synthetic fibers. And they are a lot of things. For example, producing the labels, packaging, and the main fabrics. And then those materials, raw materials, will be delivered to the manufacturer. And they will do cutting, embroidery, sewing, and a lot of other things. For different clothes, they often have different producing procedures, but there are some common things for all the productions. And then we move to the distribution period, which will involve transportation. And later, those products will be delivered to consumers. Consumers will use the clothes. 
and this can also have has certain carbon emissions. And after that, the consumers will possibly discard the garment or clothes. This can also result in more carbon emissions. So basically, for one clothes, the usage of it will account for the most of the carbon emissions. The carbon emissions coming from consumer use will account for 40 to 80 percent of the total emission. The second largest contributor to carbon emissions in the whole process is producing the raw materials, and this can differ related to different materials used. For example, the greenhouse gas emissions coming from using synthetic fibers and wools is relatively higher, while using cotton or knitting can be lower. And apart from that, transportation and a lot of other process can also have the emissions. We have just mentioned that different fabrics will have different carbon emissions. And here is a picture showing us the difference. You can conclude from this picture that the carbon emissions from using natural fabrics will be less than used synthetic fabrics. And for washing the clothes, different approaches and different temperature used in washing can also affect the carbon emissions. If we use machine washing, then the carbon emissions will be higher. Well, for a clothes brand to get the carbon footprint evaluation, they have to go through certain processes. First of all, they have to inform what they have used in the production period. And based on that, we can evaluate the carbon emissions they have produced, and all of those data will be put into our evaluation model. Then we can have a result which involves carbon emissions coming from different stages of that product, such as production, transportation, and consumption. Well, now many places are trying to put forward official carbon labels, and different institutions have different labels. Here you can see an example logo, and there is a QR code. So by scanning the QR code, consumers will know how many carbon emissions that product has produced. Well, I've already talked about different places have different carbon labels. Well, for Shenzhen, this is how we do things. So in last year, we have established a work plan to promote the carbon labels. Our goal is by 2025, we will build a public service platform. We will compile the documents for carbon labeling for more than 100 types of goods and we will build a data set and a evaluation model. And you can see that garments are actually among the first row of products to be included in this work plan. Last of all, I want to talk about how can we reach the carbon neutrality in the fashion industry. There are certain steps for us to follow. First of all, we have to identify our scope and we have to make it very quantified. We've already talked about that. They are scope one, two, and three. So what are those things? Scope one and two refers to the direct emissions coming from the operation of the enterprise. For example, the energy thermal power you have used during production. And this is directly linked to an enterprise operation. But scope three is kind of different. This involves the whole supply chain. For example, as a clothes company, I want to produce certain products, but I do not have the raw materials, then I will buy raw materials from suppliers. 
and in this process, there will be emissions, and this fall into the category of scope three. So scope three is related to the carbon emission coming from the whole supply chain. While we have a clear idea about what is scope one, two, three, then we can begin to set our target and our work plan. I've already shared some of the examples, and all of those companies, they have set specific targets for scope one, two, and three. For example, they might use 2015 as a base year, and then they will say by the time of 2030 or some other year, they will cut the carbon emissions by a certain percent. And I actually encourage companies to use natural materials when producing. And I recommend them to use renewable energies. I also encourage our consumers to wash the clothes by their own hands instead of using a machine, and because this can also cut the emissions. And with all of those tools, we can reach our carbon neutrality and net, net zero carbon emission goals. And now we can see that there is an international standard for evaluating the carbon emissions. For international community, we use ISO 14064. And for China, we also have our own specific standards. I believe that no matter those kind of standards are for international community or for certain countries, they are based on the same logic. We also need to calculate the carbon footprint of a certain product or a service. For international community, we use the standard of ISO 14067. In Shenzhen, in 2016, we have issued the general principle for carbon footprint of products. Well, our institute has been helping the fashion industry to calculate their carbon footprints. Under the guidance of Shenzhen Fashion Industry Association, we have provided services to certain brands. You can see on the bottom of this slide, we have a dress. That is from the brand Ita. So this dress actually has a very low carbon emissions, and they have used natural fabrics to make this dress. Even though the raw materials account for 53% of the total carbon emissions of this dress, however, that is still a very low level, and this is very good. And the usage period of this dress will have a even less carbon emissions. We think this is a great example to tell the consumers to reduce carbon emissions while buying certain clothes from the brand. And we also need to conduct a large-scale carbon footprint evaluation and reporting activities. You can see the left picture is one example of UK. We were also commissioned by the Shenzhen Fashion Garment Industry Association to provide technical services for Shenzhen Fashion Week 2023. We have been engaging in calculating the carbon emissions of the fashion industry and certain products. We can say that with the goal of reaching carbon neutrality and uh, net zero emissions, we advocate everyone to focus on the impact of fashion industry on the climate and to make the whole thing better. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Xu, for her sharing, which let us know the carbon emissions from certain fabrics and how can we reach carbon neutrality. 
She has provided a pathway for the industry to know how can they reduce the emissions and how can us as consumers to reduce the carbon emissions. Next, we will have the director of Amsterdam Fashion Institute, AMFI. We will have Jose Penison to give us a keynote speech. She provides strategic direction for the teaching of AMFI and guaranteeing the high standards. She has been an author, reporter, and researcher. With the experience of a lot of years in fashion, exhibition, and many other fields, she certainly has a lot to say to tell us how can we make this industry better. Today, Professor Jose will talk about how can we use education to make sure our students will be more suitable to sustainability, digitalization, and inclusivity. Now we give the floor to Professor Jose. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, yeah, I would like would like to tell you a little bit more on, um, you know, uh, especially sustainability and di digitalization and the, and the challenges of nowadays and what it means for a fashion education. I've started, I don't see the screen, the slides. I've started in my new job in Amsterdam only five weeks ago, but uh, it's an amazing institute. And a lot of, of us think, you know, the, the new ways of teaching are actually implemented in this uh, um, school. Um, do I need to change something to see my slides or are they still not up? Okay, they're coming here. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Next slide. I can use, can I, I change the slides? Oh yeah, thank you. We can go to the next one. Yeah. So Amsterdam Fashion Institute, but also the University of Applied Sciences in Amsterdam have three values. It's sustainability, digitalization, and diversity. And those three elements are also really important, especially, I think, for all areas, but really important for the fashion industry, because the fashion industry, on my next slide, is something we really have to change. I'm not able to, to um, change my slides. Yeah. Because, and I think that's really important, the fashion system we can actually um, uh, just state is broken. I think the, ne the previous lectures, the presentations also have shown that, shown that there is a need to change the industry. Uh, because, you know, we have still a push market and we're throwing a lot of clothes on the market without the demand to just test them if people are buying it. But there are new dig digital ways actually in just, you know, in the end, we will we'll just end in a system where we only start to produce with advanced manufacturer when things are ordered. Fashion was something, you know, uh, uh, each new fashion, each new trend was there starting a new season. But now every new minute a blogger is, is you know, is, is presenting a new collection. So the system about new trends, new fashion, something there is broken too. And then, of course, what's also mentioned in the previous lectures, the fashion system it has the fast fashion has led us to the bottom of cheap, cheap fashion, which also means cheap labor, inferior products, a lot of pollution, and a lot of carbon footprint. So mm -hmm. therefore, it's really urgent that we just rethink our linear productions and need to learn the more circular processes such as reuse or repair of those kind of different elements. We can go to the next slide. Um, so therefore, again, again, the focus of 
Um, some fashion institute is really thinking in sustainability and then in fair production and circular product production, really thinking about digital product development, 3D knitting, advanced manufacture, but also made to measure. And the last one, which is also, I think, really rethink the values of fashion. What actually is fashion and what's the, the value of a fashion product? So there, that, I think, are the three main drivers for AMFI. Go, please, next slide, please. <clears throat> Our vision is that, you know, fashion and dress and the whole fashion is really essential to the world. It's really an important fact. We dress every day. But it's also a part of our identity, and it's 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 an expression form, which is I think very meaningful and very much connected to uh, personal life of everyone. Fashion, if we do it right, can bring positive change to industry, society, and our planet. And students and professionals are able to create those changes, and therefore, and that's our vision and mission. Amphi is educated change makers. That's our. Um, so we are uh, educate uh, change makers for the industry. Next slide, please. So we empower our students also to grow and to develop this conscious critical thinking and to become a future proof professional. And I will explain later how we are doing this. We also think it's really important to um, have the right community of learning so we have an international community and we also bring students from different disciplines together because we really, really believe in teamwork and also bringing expertise from different areas together to you know to to create this change and to think innovative research is also very important for us and we are you know of course based in amsterdam and you, we use that as a creative hub next slide please for our students, next slide, please. We are empowering, um, um, you know, them, you know, to be each individual to become, um, to really to, to make them responsible fashion designers, fashion entrepreneurs, or fashion marketeers. So that's our big aim. Next slide, please. And again, next slide, please. We are doing this from a transdisciplinary equality learning community with creativity and craftsmanship at core. Next slide, please. And again, we collaborate and connect and trying to form a diverse and inclusive community. And we're doing it, next slide, please, from our location in Amsterdam, where a lot of startup and um, initiatives are uh, 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 based, but also Big brands as PDH and Nike have their European head offices and R&D. So it gives us an excellent location to really work global at the same time as being abandoned globally. Next slide, please. So fashion, Amphi is actually, uh, is, has three disciplines. Fashion design, fashion branding, and fashion business development. With fashion design, it's for us really important to learn our students the craft, the analog tools, together with the digital tools. We also think it's really important to <clears throat> make them aware of the societal, ethical, and aesthetic um, elements, and make them really trying to make them really conscious and um, <clears throat> responsible um, designers who are aware of sustainable in uh, um, challenges, making sure things are transparent. They really are, for us, uh, having giving them good insight in supply chain is really important. So they, we were really just educate them, you know, um, uh, with a lot of insight in how the, how the whole production pr process is actually initiated. At the same time, we also try to think with them and work with um, all kinds of small brand in the local city, building communities, thinking about, you know, uh, working with um, rec um, um, recycled products, but also with communities, with a distance to um, a working force and making sure we just connect and build a community. Next slide, please. Our second pillar, our second discipline is fashion branding on the next slide. And this is much more as to do with um, uh, building a brand, 
also these students really get an insight in the whole supply chains and the whole production and how actually the fashion industry is organized. But also here, it's really important that I um, learn and get the abilities to make a positive impact and change in the fashion industry and societies. So here also concept storytelling, but also thinking in new possibilities and change in uh, trying to create fashion for the better is actually a driving force. The last one is the fashion business and development discipline. And here again, uh, it's, it's also thinking in um, the change of the fashion industry, which actually means that we need to be more responsible, social and ethical, but also thinking in the new options because a lot of uh, because of digitalization and because of thinking in circularity, it means also that the business is really fundamental changing. So we learn our students and learn from best practices and learn also from the possible option in how to start a business in a completely di different way as we used to do it. Instagram for re to, to, to sell an online, as an online brand, there are a lot of different ways to do it, but especially thinking circular and not thinking in ways, but actually, again, you know, using it as a, as a, um, as a starting point to start a business is a fundamentally change. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So it's one of the important things. So we have different specialization and we're looking here into our BA program. What for us is really important is to uh, give students an option in uh, making their own choice. They can, for example, ch uh, choose for a more digital direction with 3D hyperpath or 3D knit. They can focus on a sustainable denim. They can also focus on a more theoretical uh, um, elements in the course. But what I think is really important, so there are specializations, but also the minors, where we bring together to the different um, disciplines together. And they have to work, and that's my next slide, on what we call reality school. And this is a, for a long time already existing at AMFI. And it actually mean, means that we're bringing in this, in this um, graduation stage of the students, we bring the communities together. So our business and development students work together with our branding students and the design students on a sort of reality school um, coming together to work to um, um, develop um, a small collection. We do this in collaboration with um, existing brands here in, um, in Amsterdam. And uh, the last couple of years we work for it, we work with social responsible um, uh, brands, for example, and last year we worked with a brand this year with a brand that actually worked on upcycling. So this is actually for us a really important um, uh, learning curve for the students where they actually um, have to work together as in real life and just to produce a small collection, do the branding and think about the sales. In this, in this in this specific case, the sales was a, a, a hiring, a, a rental, a rental uh, service for those uh, small for the small collection. Next slide, please. Another thing is here again is is what I think is also what Amphi tries to do and why they give choice is just you know d diving in the latest technology about three uh, D knitting. We have an alignment with uh, by Bora, which is a, a, an interesting startup that does works with a, a great industry. And this is also uh, really, you know, trying to stay on the forefront of the digitalization and on the changes happening in the industry. And that is an area where also students can focus on. The next slide, please. And this is all coming from, on the next slide, you can see it from, uh, um, a project that I worked on in my previous life, London College of Fashion, with a lot of European partners, where we tried, you know, to look into the changes, how fashion technology is affecting education, and what kind of new job roles are coming, uh, are foreseen in the industry. And this is, for example, you know, with the, where we actually think that, um, 
working in in the change in the industry, which is has will dramatically change, uh, especially when we talk about fashion tech. We also need to work and to understand engineers. We need to understand IT people. We need to understand sometimes biologists who are making new materials. So it's even broader than working uh, business, uh, marketing, and and designers together. That's existing in the industry, but the future industry will actually. Um, request a bigger uh, in even more expanded teamwork with different areas coming together and one of the the results of this that actually soft skills become re really important people need to be able to work in teams it might be even more um, important than be becoming you know a, a, a star designer you really need to have this communication skills to really making sure that you know um, the change and the, the practice where you're working on or the challenge that you try to solve like a, uh, a challenge in 3d knitting or uh, applications of new material of trying to digitalize your whole design process you really need to work as a team and therefore these these skills are really important that's why we're offering reality schools so students really learn to work in teams also, on top of it, it also means that the subject-specific skills, so we are talking about three in AMPI, but if you really are serious about that, the technology and engineering will be an area that will be very much strongly lin linked to fashion area, we'll, you'll see a lot of new um, uh, job roles coming through. Um, and also, you see that actually in what used to be like maybe fashion history, or fashion business, the human social culture, economic context, they're even also coming up new things like sustainability, circularity, we all know about, but also data science and an understanding of policy matrix, ethics, those elements are new in the center, in, 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 the, in the whole area of fashion, uh, the fashion system. And at the same time, also um, the, the job of fashion designers and the, the branding becomes something else where also, again, data become very important, but also, for example, in fashion, what, what is new for design is to think about a uh, user experience, not throwing things on the market, but understand your customers and maybe make things for your customers. So this actually, you know, the, the rationale also behind the system that we work with reality schools and trying to work to collaborate as much as possible with the local industry. Next slide, please. So my last thing is, so this is our work in progress where we still having digitalization, sustainability, and also the diversity and new values as the main driver or that, that should be embedded in our education. And then I think as the last thing is what we try to do is shift away of a focus on the, on on the, on trends and on the new and just repeat all, all every time you know it should be the new thing in fashion in and instead we would highlight the product so fashion should be much more about the product and we should very much more think about the values of the product and that could be how it is made under what kind of circumstances is it made so the the sustainable narrative but it could also be other things, you know, but we really need to rethink the value of what fashion, what fashion or clothing, clothes are and why we're wearing things and, you know, trying to keep them wearing. So introducing those new values in fashion, ethics and storytelling is, I think, the only way to try to degrow, which is essential to reduce our footprint, because that in the end is the ultimate um, challenge because we are um using too much um uh the, uh the our earth is not able you know to we cannot sustain this um this way of being so we really need to think about producing less but for the better thank you very much Well, we thank Professor Joseph for 
her speech telling us how AFMMI has used education to develop talents and inject more energy for the fashion industry to develop better. If you have any questions, you can send your questions in the live stream channel, and we will ask our speakers to answer your questions during the QA session. Next, the presenter will be a designer. Previously, in Lupi's presentation, we heard how Z generation are adopting their environmental protection priorities. So we have now invited a Z generation designer to share with us about her fur free and sustainable journey. She is Zhang Sijia. She graduated from London Fashion College, and after her uh, graduation design went on the catwalk stage in London. She, she called attention of multiple uh, media in the international society. She worked in several famous fashion houses, such as Martin Magriella, the previous director's brand, Mario Schwab, and David Comas, etc. While she was pursuing her postgraduate study, she learned about sustainable fashion in fashion management studies. And then she uh, established her own brand, Sija Studio, and also joined our Fur Free Alliance in 2020. Now let's give the floor to Zhang Sijia to talk about her Fur Free and Sustainable journey, please. Hello, everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Hello everyone, I am very pleased to join today's 2023 Compassion for Fashion Forum. My presentation today will be the fur free and sustainable journey of a Generation Z designer. Our brand introduction, let me briefly talk about that. Sija Studio, a contemporary sustainable women's wear label approaching a modern aesthetic from a vintage inspired perspective. Our brand stands for garments with timeless potential in everyone's wardrobe by strongly focusing on the original design, sustainability, and durability. Our inspiration for each quarter comes from different historical and cultural backgrounds. The concept may start from simple or complicated things, but all are uh, put into elegant and uh, simple modern frameworks. The name is Suja Studio, not Studio, because we want to eliminate the uh, fiber, chemical fiber things that are uh, negative to environmental protection. That's why we eliminated that particular letter T, which represents uh, chemical fibers out of our name. That is why our company's name, uh, the brand's name is Suja Studio, not Studio. So some pictures of our products. Just now, uh, Echo had introduced to me, so I'm not going to elaborate too much on those details, but I have a, a Xiaohongshu account, which is at Sijia Sijia. You can see that at the uh, bottom uh, right of the screen. You can follow me on Xiaohongshu. Here, you can see some celebrities have been endorsing our product, Zhao Lusi, Zeng Li, and Qin Lan, uh, wearing our uh, vegan leather from Qin Lan. You see that, that dress? And Zeng Li is in a picture wearing a certified eco-friendly Wesco fiber sweater. And now I would like to tell you about why I started out to build this for a free brand. The first point is that 
the year I started my own business is when we first have COVID-19. At that time, I started thinking about the relationship between human animals and uh, the nature. It also has become something uh, aware by society. I watched some documentaries and people around me also encouraged me to make me think that this is quite important and necessary. Sustainable fashion also started to gain more attention in the fashion industry. So the college I went to, London Co College of Fashion, is also a fashion college which very much focused on sustainable fashion, and I was deeply influenced by that academic environment. Third reason is that uh, I have noticed that there had been some nice fundamental uh, environment. For example, for us as designers, we have those available uh, alternative materials and other organizations and agencies, institutions, and the people who can support us. And here, I'd like to show you some of the things that we discovered, the latest launched into the market of these vegan leather products, which can prove to you how we have those resources available for us to uh, build that as tools, as designers. There are suppliers, agencies, organizations, and institutions who can supply these materials and the resources which can help us to accelerate a more sustainable fashion. And now I'd like to share with you what we have done in a process since our startup. First of all, our uh, product is committed to use 100% against animal products, and we are proud to label, to uh, specifically strengthen our vegan leather property and the sustainable uh, significance of it. Every uh, tag on our product, we have very detailed parameter uh, tables, just like a dossier, to tell the consumers what fabric it is exactly and how to maintain and uh, how to better protect and use it for a longer term. We also tell them whether this is a degradable fabric or the manufacturing process of it have uh, avoided the harming animals, etc. As it helps the consumer to understand how sustainability is something that they can choose and the significance of doing so. And on social media, we would use texts and uh, tags to clearly label the pure vegan uh, property of our products. And we are among very few brands who can do that in the national market because, first of all, for market attention, this is not something quite popular or eye-catching. But anyway, we kept on doing that so that for the people, for the consumer who can or who would like to understand us can further uh, understand it and keep on paying attention to us. And we would also uh, strengthen the sustainability property of our brand to those social media KOLs that we cooperate with so that the fur free concept by leveraging their influence and their followers we can uh, radiate this concept to even more audiences. And here I would like to share with you really uh, the uh, famous fashion magazine in China. They have such a uh, column which focuses on sustainability topics. Uh, they have interviewed us and have given a report to tell people about the significance of our sustainability works. And here I would like to show you some of our vegan products. Last autumn and winter, they were really liked by the consumers, which also made me feel much assured. Because when we first started the business, I was really worried at our pricing and segmentation in the market with such vegan product properties will the consumers be really uh, reluctant to take and accept our products. For example, we are worried that some people think our products at such a price should definitely use genuine leather and fur, etc. But actually, the sales and the feedback from the market told us that these vegan products have a pretty strong potential market. Those vegan products, uh, sweaters, shirts, and fall fall, 
sulfur uh, products, coats, etc., are very popular among the consumers. Against the current backdrop in the market, those consumers really would like to uh, choose the brand with such a strong voice, just like ours. And in that process, we've also received that there had been some uh, feedback that are not that satisfactory. But I would like to tell you that most Chinese consumers we observe are very supportive to vegan leather or vegan leather concept. But some Chinese consumers, unfortunately, would uh, refer to vegan leather exactly like polyurethane, and they would be disappointed at using non-animal farm the first. And some uh, Chinese consumers don't know how to uh, actually take uh, maintain and uh, to use in the longer term of vegan leather products because they are used to genuine leather and they don't know how to deal with it. So this is a direction in which we can focus more in our communication in the future. So overall, we believe that the the promotion of fur free fashion, there's a few core problems. Just like as I said, some Chinese consumers in a more traditional thinking mindset, they think that in between vegan leather and natural or genuine leather, they believe that uh, the natural genuine leather is more precious, more expensive than the worth paying attention to while vegan leather or fall fur are simply a cheaper alternative, an artificial product which comes secondary instead of something being chosen as the first priority. This issue is quite prevalent because many Chinese consumers do not understand how vegan leather should be the product to be adopted more than that because simply they don't understand the background significance of vegan leather for protecting the environment and animal well-being. Those deeper value wasn't exposed to them, and without that, the comparison in between vegan products, vegan leather, and animal fur, they would simply hold on to their original mindset. In our market testing, we found that within the core perspective, we need to set ourselves in a framework of long-term practices and hold on to it to go gradually, step by step, pass on that information related to uh, vegan leather. That's why we have established our action plans. As a designer brand, we have many potential audiences who are the Gen Z or the consumers who have more customized the buyers who buy from those channels. We have that responsibility and the necessity to establish cooperation with the international leading vegan leather suppliers. For example, those new materials I've shown you, there are quite a lot of stories we can tell about. For example, materials made from cactus or from uh, uh, other plant-based materials. Those stories must be intriguing in order to uh, allow the consumers to be uh, attracted and interested in. Secondly, is that we must collaborate with uh, animal protection or green fashion and other agencies. I really feel pleasure, uh, feel it as a pleasure to work together with uh, Act Asia um, FFR. We received a lot more information in our communication and are able to convey that to our consumers so that they can understand this is something, well, a great concept endorsed by professional teams so that we could be more convincing. And we would like to continue strengthening that 
afterwards. Next is in terms of uh, sales and uh, publicity channels, we would uh, strengthen our continued education for the consumers. Just like I said, those negative influences or negative uh, concepts about the vegan leather of the consumers because they lack of such education and they don't see the longer term significance and which is exactly something that we could uh, mitigate through such continuous education in the longer term. And fourthly, last but not least, we want to create better for free products and to make for free and people's willingness to buy more hooked up. Just like previous, uh, pre one of the previous presenters said, that the Gen Z has less loyalty to certain brands, but only good designs and good product would trigger their willingness to buy. So if we could incorporate our designs into um, high quality, nice product, and that for a free concept would be easily easier uh, accepted by the consumers and uh, more easily uh, comprehended by them. Last but not least, I also would like to share with you some of the uh, other sustainable products that we've been using other than uh, for free and the vegan platter. On the right left side, you see, uh, which is a wide 3D cropped half skirt, we use 100% tensile and the raw wood pulp were from FSC certified forest wood pulp. The sustainability property of it have ensured its biodegradability much higher than international standards. And with that shirt, also on the right side, you see that the SS23 collection, the black satin shirt and the black uh, dress made from 100% eco-circle fibers. This is a recycled polyester, which is made from uh, chemically recycling those used polyester products. So this process would help us to reduce carbon dioxide emission and energy consumption by 50% when compared with the traditional methods while maintaining the same quality features and feel and that touch. So with those, we can choose those suppliers who meet with the international standards and cooperate with them. Though due to some reality limitations, we cannot use 100% sustainable fabrics right now, but we would definitely prioritize on using those and tell the stories and the significance of it to our consumers and we would also try more uh, to use uh, the uh, more natural uh, textiles, fabrics, including linen and the silks, to tell them that how our product would have a lower carbon emission that can be recycled, refabricated, or regenerated with higher quality so that our consumers would also take sustainability in fashion more easily. So that is all from my perspective today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sujia. Thank you, Sujia, very much. Well, from Sujia's presentation, we can see that Gen Z, just like uh, Lupi have previously mentioned, they've been taking these practices on their own to uh, adopt those priorities over environmental protections. So just shared with us uh, the feedbacks they have received in terms of uh, vegan leather from the market and the challenges and her feelings. All right, so now we're going to have a Q&A session. And in this session, we will uh, invite uh, Sylvia Tsai, Senior Caring for Life Education Project Officer at Act Asia, to host it. Now we give the board to Sylvia. Okay, thank you, thank you, Echo. I'm going to host the QA session. First of all, I want to invite all of our three speakers, Professor Josie from AMFI, Lupi, and Sijia to open your camera. We have collected some questions from our audience. They want to discuss with all of you further.
Dado, could you please all turn on your camera? Um, hi, uh, hi, Professor uh, Tunison, are you here now? Hi, yeah, now Professor Tunison, are you here now? Section and we have some questions from the audience. Yeah. We are going to have the Q and A session. So, could you please turn on your camera? Okay, it seems like we need a little bit more time for Professor Tonison to go online. So first of all, we will give the question to Sixian. So you are very forward-looking Gen Z designer, and you have talked about a lot of actions for promoting sustainability by Sixia Studio, for example, choosing new materials. So my question is that, based on your appearance, for Gen Z new designers, how can we play our role in making the whole industry more sustainable? I think we Gen Z designers are like an advocate. So actually, the consumers of designer brands are certainly less than those huge brands, but we also have advantages. That is, we are very familiar with the South media, and we know a lot of issues and topics that young people are interested. So we have a bigger influence among those young people. For example, we have been cooperating with some very famous store. And some of our design values and philosophies will further be more publicized by our products, more by those celebrities. So I think we are just like those little guiders to tell the young people some of our new values. Well, thank you very much. And we go back to Luby. So we have many new designers. They are really creative and innovative. They are using more interactive approaches to market their products, and this is a very important thing. Now we have a second question for Sujia. You talk about a very important part, that is, for the post-pandemic era, no matter for consumers or for designers, we have changed our mindset. I think you also have real experience of this. So I want to ask, for the post-pandemic period, how can designers and uh, brands to cope with the biggest challenge of sustainable development. What is the biggest challenge? I think the biggest challenge is that consumers, they have not recovered their expectations for the market. Their expectations still stayed in the pre-pandemic era or during the pandemic era because for the past three years in the pandemic, our mindset has been changed. And this kind of change is a heavy blow to fashion industry. But we believe that we will recover this in the third quarter of this year. There is a possibility. So I think the future is, is very promising. Well, thank you very much. 
I am not a designer or a worker in the fashion industry, but we have been learning from the education related in fashion field that this is indeed a very challenging and a very promising industry. We face a lot of challenges, for example, the pandemic and climate change. Therefore, we have become more aware that we have to think about the coexistence of human beings with animals. So we have to take urgent actions. Therefore, we believe for Suda Studio and many other designers and brands in this fashion field, we will certainly have a better tomorrow. We will have a brand new start. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suda. We have two more new questions for Lupi. And maybe something is wrong with her connection, so she could not turn on her camera, but it's fine, we can still continue our communication. The first question for Lupi is that you've talked about the priorities of environmental protection for Gen Z. One of the most important is anti-greenwashing. This is also a hotspot issue that fashion field really cares. So I want to ask Lupi to talk more about what is the ESG as well as the corporate social responsibility, as well as how can enterprises to better cope with those challenges. What is the most important thing for them to engage in such anti-greenwash activities? I think, first of all, publicity is about branding, is about marketing. But still, we have to make sure that this kind of marketing is objective. Because consumers, they are very smart. They will not buy everything you said. They will go online, search for the real information. So I think when marketing, we have to remain honest. And we have to be more reliable. Well, thank you. So you talk about the transparency and um, offering the real information. So basically, a brand has to establish a trustworthy connection with these consumers. Another question is that you've talked about a lot of examples and the values of Gen Z. So a lot of brands in this field have already known that the Gen Z consumers, they really care about sustainable development. And they know fashion field has a large impact on the environment. And we know supply and demand are very important. So just now, in your speech, you've talked about Gen Z's impact on the enterprise strategy. So I want to ask, that, can you share something about for the influence of a brand and enterprise? How do you think we can build a brand and to cast impact on our consumers so as to encourage those kind of green consumer behaviors. I think there is certainly something we can do. I remember there is a brand that has done this. So they have a lot of stock fabrics in stock and they have recycled those fabrics and you reuse those fabrics. They not only use this kind of waste fabrics from its own enterprise, they also connect waste fabrics from other industries. I think this is a very relevant approach and it is pretty much focused on a certain clear direction. 
I think for strategy part, they have to be inclusive and diverse. Because if we only sell products, then we will not have a huge influence or impact. So, as brands, we need to collaborate with other brands and to make the whole branding more publicized. And they have used certain ways to attract the consumers at the C end. I think this is a pretty smart move, and we can learn from that. Thank you. This is a great example. Every brand has its own loyal consumers or a certain targeted consumers. So for the whole supply chain, an enterprise might choose certain approaches to, to produce or to do marketing, and all of those actions can have an impact. Those kind of big brands or brands that have a great influence believe that they can do something to make the consumers more aware of sustainable and green consumption. I think this is a great thing. Well, thank you, Lupi. Now we will have some, we also have some questions about education in fashion field. So, hi. Professor Tennyson. Hi. Well, we thank you, Professor, for being here. And we know that we have a time difference. So you have got up very early to attend this course. We really thank you for your effort. We have talked about the AMFS education on sustainability, digitalization, and inclusivity. You have offered a great example for the fellow educators in fashion industry to learn. So some of our audience want to engage more with you. So apart from the key three elements you have presented in the keynote speech, what do you think of scalability impact on Gen Z's designs, is it very important? For example, if we have a great production and uh, recycling model, for example, we produce 100 products each year. And if this model should be extended, like we produce 10,000 products, do you think this kind of transfer, transferring of the model can have a huge impact in our industry? I think uh, exactly, I think we need to think in new processes, but at the same time, I think we also look, look, should look into our consumer behavior. So there is something what we need, need to understand because it's not only making sure everything is, is you know, we can recycle it again. We, a circularity also means that we need to think in um, keeping it in the loop before we start to, re to recycle it. So it's also important to maybe think in mental systems or in products that you might be able to adapt during the lifetime, or designing something that's so precious that you actually want to keep it instead of um, uh, throwing it away. And I know this is very much against maybe what the Gen Z or a new generation is promoting because it's fashion is very much about the image that you produce for your Instagram. And then that might be <clears throat> A reason to buy something new again. So I think it's re what's also apart from really thinking in circular system and not throwing things away. It's really important to think in values and also the valuable thing about how precious cl a piece of clothing is because it took a lot of time and effort to make a fabric and to make a piece of cloth. 
Is that an answer to your question? Thank you, Professor, for your answer. Another question is more directly linked to education. Now there are many popular fashion schools, and they have different competitive advantages. So, do you think those kind of different com comparative advantages will hinder the connection or communication between different institutions? And can this hinder the overall innovation in the whole fashion industry? And we would love you to share some examples if you do have some great yeah. examples. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I, you know, we have as a fashion institute over the world, we have a strong, you know, network uh, initiated by ITI, International Federation of Fashion Technologies Institutes. And this is actually a network where we are sharing um, uh, things about new forms of education and how it changes, which is also a network which works closely with the industry. So that we know from the industry where they're looking for so <clears throat> I think at one hand, there's definitely, you know, uh, collaborations and uh, especially in Europe, when you have European funds, it actually helps people to engage and talk to each other about how to make the curriculum more sustainable. We did a great project in that with LCF, for example. So I don't think it is, you know, we are, it's not like an industry that we protect, you know, the way we educate. I think it's, it's open for everyone. But I can see, you know, there is still something like, especially in fashion education, like, you know, the the high-end um, 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 fashion institutes like Antwerp, which for, you know, for, for a long history already have like, um, are, are ranked very high in education. But, you know, I think we are also a past that, you know, um, we, we, we are past that, um, area of time so I think we are much more open but I think at the same time you should also really align yourself to the local environment where you are embedded because you you I think for myself speaking I think you need to build the networks with the industry in your local environment and at the sa same time stay in touch with the global um, uh, a global industry but also a global network of education so it's a great question, I, so, but I think we are open because we all together need to learn what are, you know, where are we heading towards and what, how is the industry changing? What are, what are the new, what is, what is the new best practice? What is actually the new direction that we're moving towards? So translating that back into a, a curriculum, we need to work together because, you know, it will help everyone to learn from it. So. I would definitely, you know, encourage to work together, and I think we do already with the ITI network, the International Federation of Fashion Technology and Institutes. So that's also, I think, a great network for it. But I can see the danger that some of the educations are maybe a bit protective, but I don't think see so. Thank you. Well, thank you for your answer. We believe that in this diverse environment, educators and workers in the field can see that we have collaborations from different disciplines, from different fields, and we are rooted in our community. We are connected with our local environment. We also connect with the external world, and we all believe that this is very relevant for sustainable development of fashion field. So today we thank 
our three speakers. Thank you very much for attending this forum. You have shown us that there is sparkles coming out of communications between different stakeholders. And if you have any questions for Professor Xu, you can also send your question in the live stream channel, and we can help you to get her feedback after this forum. Now I'm going to return the host rights to Echo. Well, thank you, Sylvia, and thank you, all of our speakers, for your wonderful sharing. We know that there are a lot of extreme weather, as well as the biodiversity loss because of the climate change. We all know those things impacts are very severe. Well, China has issued a white paper to reach the carbon neutrality and carbon net zero carbon emissions, from which we can see that as a citizen in the planet, we cannot avoid those challenges. We need to reduce carbon emissions in our daily life. ACT Asia has been engaging in this process too. We have been educating children workers and educators about how can we become more responsible for sustainable development? How can we stay symbiotic with the nature? Just as Mr. Xie Zhenghua, former commissioner at the National Reform and Development Commission, has said, now we are at a turning point of transforming the whole industry. This also applies to the fashion industry. The green development of industry is an irresistible, irresistible trend. We believe that there will be more designers, fashion field workers, manufacturers joining us in this process for sustainable development. If you want to learn more about zero fur, and its relationship with fashion, animal, and our environment, you can sign up for our course. We now thank again for our speakers, for, for Mr. Xu Lijie, as well as Professor Tennyson and all other speakers. We also thank our simultaneous interpreters, Peter and Nikki. We thank all of our audience for your patience. Now I invite all of you to turn on your cameras and we will take a group picture. Yeah, <laughs> Ready, we are going to take the group photo. Okay, great, thank you, thank you all. And this marks the end of our foreign today. Thank you all for your patience. I hope that we will have more gathering like this in the future. Thank you.